got to get to come to Seattle. And uh, I am almost done. I am at 114,976 words into League of Dragons, which will be the final volume of the Temeraire series. And I'm really, I, you know, it's one of those things where I was really excited to be done, and now I'm getting close to the end, and it's starting to feel a little bittersweet. And just, um, but I feel, I, I really like a complete story myself. And that's one of the reasons why I uprooted um, and why I'm moving into writing standalone novels in general. And basically, I am here to answer questions. Um, I might read a little piece of uprooted if you guys are interested. But uh, I know a lot of you, how many of you are Tamara fans? <laughs> So, you know, why don't I start with just taking questions about Tamara, see what you guys want to talk about. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll break that. Good for it. We've done that. I, I'm a good fan of this. I guess, yeah, so, oh, cool. uh, I'll try to speak to you later. But uh, David, I was wondering just to each other what might have prompted you. He probably knows, but I don't. Um, and so much of the action in uh, sci-fi and fantasy and adult, as well as uh, you know, readers, has been a series around what prompted you to go the Standalone. Mm. Well, honestly, what prompted me to go to the standalone route was having a series go to nine volumes. <laughs> um, and I said, never again. Um, it's just, you know, it's, I do feel that there's something that happens when you end a story. Um, that if you land it successfully, and I'm trying really hard to do this in League of Dragons, where whenever you're writing, there are sort of threads that that sometimes some of them slip off the page, some of them go on, um, some of them sink to the background, some of them come to the foreground, and a really satisfying ending that brings everything to a sort of natural kind of close, even though that doesn't ever happen in real life. I think in a book, it makes everything that came before it feel richer. And I do feel that there's value in finishing things um, in that way. And that's why I, and I find it easier to do it in the most satisfying way in a standalone. Um, and having had, you know, and it's, it's quite hard to do it across a series and sustain it across a series, sustain that energy across a series. So that's part of why I'm doing standalones now. And part of the other reason is I've been writing Temer for almost 10 years and I have this whole backlog of ideas that I want to do. Um, I have another idea. Uprooted was inspired very much by Polish fairy tales um, and Russian folk tales that I know because I'm of Russian and Polish descent. And it's really close to my own heart. It's in many ways about the experience of being the child of immigrants. But um, I have other stories that I want to kind of tell, I think, that are similarly influenced by fairy tales. I really want to do one that's inspired a little bit by um, the Snow Queen and Norse mythology. Um, that's actually a sci-fi novel, um, but nevertheless riffs on, on those fairy tales. Um, I have one story that I want to tell that's basically about um, a techno mage in a kind of steampunk um, Victorian era who, um, who summons her familiar and accidentally gets a werewolf. Um, and, uh, you know, there are just so many ideas piled up that I really want to tell, and I will never get to them if I keep telling series. Yes? Um, you mentioned that you've been writing Cam Rare for so long, and now that you're almost at the end, if you could go back to the beginning of the series of the first few volumes, is there anything that you would change? You know, it's interesting because for me, the question is, um, if I, now that I'm almost done with Temeraire, if I could go back to the beginning and change anything about those volumes, what, what if anything, would I change? And, you know, for me, when I finish a book, I'm kind of done with it. In fact, I, um, I've written stories where I pick them up several years later and read them, and while I'm like, wow, this is a good story, who wrote it? And I literally get to the end of the story, and I scroll back up, and I realize that I wrote it, and I, don't, I hadn't remembered the story. Um, that's how sort of thoroughly things leave me when I'm finished with them. 
So I feel like I wouldn't change it. I mean, if I was writing it from scratch now, I would do it differently. There are things that I would do differently, but I can't even imagine it without actually doing it. Um, I think the first book, you know, the first book, by the time I got to the end, I knew that there was sort of more happening in the world um, that I created and that there were more stories that were going to be told. So I had the opportunity, which was great, um, because Delray released the first three books together. Um, I had to write the first three at the same time. So I was able to kind of go back to the first three and see all sorts of things like, um, you know, in volume four, I hope I'm not spoiling anyone, but in volume four where they find the uh, cure for the dragon plague um, in Africa, I was able to see that in book two because, you know, as I finished volume three, I knew what was going on um, in, in England. I knew that the dragons were sick and I was able to go back and sort of plant Temur getting sick and plant them seeing the dragon that brought the infection over. So I don't know that I would change anything, ultimately. Are there any things that you guys feel would, that you would like to know more about, let's say? Yes? Personally, I think I'd like to know more like, about the American dragons and the Canadian dragons, because it's part of a role that you haven't covered yet, and I'm hoping the League of Dragons will, we might see a little bit more of that. So, I was, yes. I was really in intrigued by that one dragon, one rider with the Dakotas. Mm -hmm. And it'd be interesting to see how the Native American culture might have been changed drastically by having access to flight and dragons and versus the change when they got the horses, when the Spanish brought the, the horses over. Yes, so the question, um, the, the thing that she mentioned was um, that she'd like to see more about uh, American and Canadian dragons. I'm sorry, I'm repeating the questions also for the, for the recording. Um, but, uh, so that's, um, that is not, we're not going to get much of that in League of Dragons, sadly. But I will reveal that there's a possibility that may get touched on in future in possibly graphic novel form. So, we'll see. Yes? Um, along those lines, I know I've seen you mention online that you would be um, willing to do future short stories in the Temporary Universe. Would you be able to say anything about what those would be? So future short stories in the Temporary Universe, I am currently, some of you may know about this, um, a few years ago, just before I had my child, um, I held a fan art contest where basically we invited fan artists to submit art and we'd pick the best pieces and do a, we're going to do a limited edition charity book, um, printing the art pieces and I'm going to write short stories um, for the, the five winners each get a story of a thousand words inspired by their piece. The smaller pieces all get um, a drabble of a hundred words. And all of these are going to be inspired by the different pieces of art that won the contest. And doing this just before having a child was not the smartest idea. <laughs> um, and it has gotten delayed and delayed while I was finishing the actual Temeraire books, which were the most pressing deadline each time. Um, but finally, I am done. And also, the book required one longer story to be kind of the anchor of the book to make it possible for them to print um, the art in color. So uh, fortunately, I am almost done with that anchor story, which is going to be called um, Dragons and Decorum. And it's the story of Captain Elizabeth Bennett and her dragon, Wollstonecraft. And uh, yes, I'm having a really almost illegal amount of fun writing that story. And uh, yes, and, and poor Darcy. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> so yes. Uh, I've always been curious, I'm not one of the, the people who perused the forms very much, what gave all the inspiration for your characters, because like, for your dragons, like Maximus is one of my favorites because he has so much childishness to him, he's like, oh no, I'm not afraid of I swear. And, then, <laughs> and, and Temi, of course, he's, that, that's a personality. <laughs> what, what inspired you to, to bring those? Um, I, you know, it's interesting. The dragons came all came very naturally to me. Um, I think that 
to me, the cornerstone of dragon personality is that they're not motivated by fear at all. They are never, they've never really been hunted in their evolution. That was kind of one of my core principles. And so they're much less, um, their, their anxieties and fears are largely centered on status, um, on their hierarchy, and you know who gets to have eggs. Um, and uh, that's, that's kind of the core of their, of their personality and how they interact. Um, and that, in a way, kind of, I think that they're in some ways less complicated than people. Um, not, and complicated is not the right word. They're as complex as people, but they're, they're often more straightforward. Um, as you would be if you were 20 tons and had, you know, jaws full of shark teeth um, and were your, the apex predator <laughs> in your area. Um, but the dragons, um, the personalities of the dragons, it's just the same way that I create the personality of a human character. Um, I try to balance the characters against one another and have them reflect to some extent their, what they're doing, what their context is. And to some extent, it's the, you know, it's something to, that gives different dragons conflicts among each other, um, having different personalities, and um, and sort of more broadly, I come up with dragon types, um, thinking about what the people in the region where the dragons are would have bred for. In the case of harness dragons, dragons that have been bred up specifically for use. Um, and that's frequently inspired by um, like regal coppers, Maximus is a regal copper, that's a butterfly. Um, and there's a whole set of, um, there's like regal copper um, in the books, there's regal copper, malachite copper, um, gray copper, and the idea is that these breeds are all quite closely related, um, and it's just they've been refined in different ways. Um, before we were talking about our favorite dragons, do you have a favorite dragon that you've written? I love Temerar. You know, Temerar is my favorite. I have, you know, he was my first, um, and I, I love him. I love Iskerica. Um I love Volley, the little, the little dragon, um, and uh, and I'm quite fond of a new dragon that I'm not going to tell you about. <laughs> But uh, I like Kulin Gile a lot too. I feel like he's just sort of this uh, almost always easygoing, laid back dragon. All the other dragons are all like kind of prickly about him because he's so big and he's just like, hey. <laughs> <coughs> yes, Dwayne? I've got two questions. If you and I were arguing about Polish versus Russian, would you say the, the new book is more Polish or Russian in culture or in character? Or? Uh, the question is about Uprooted, and I'll show up my beautiful cover again, um, whether it's more Polish versus Russian. I would say it's more Polish, um, just because, you know, when I grew up, my mother would read fairy tales to me in Polish, um, and we had several collections of Polish fairy tales. Um, and in Poland also, there's a very strong, in Polish legends and, and just in general in the culture, there's a strong connection with the forest, um, which is normally a very positive force um, in Polish stories. And the, the woods are both positive and negative in this, and, but the book sort of very much taps into that general kind of feeling of the importance and centrality of the woods. Okay, the other question was, um, is there an upper limit on the intelligence of a dragon? Because it becomes clear, I think, in book two, that Demerar is much smarter than Lawrence, but Lawrence is stupid. Like Demerar, <laughs> understand Newt, which is beyond most of us. Yeah, right. I was just curious, you know, what league do you see the book of a dragon? Um, I think the intelligence of dragons is somewhat different than ours. Um, in fact, in League of Dragons, we're going to see that um, dragons have, uh, in some cases, very um, extremely good mathematical skills. Um, we've also seen a little bit in the other books that um, they find non-Euclidean geometry um, extremely intuitive. <coughs> which makes sense because they live very much in, in, um, in curved space um, across larger dimensions, and that made sense to me. Um, I think Temerer is obviously unusually gifted, 
um, and has certain particular talents. Um, and I thought, I just felt that that was kind of fun to play with. That's sort of an interesting aspect to have a dragon who's also extremely um, intellectual and and sort of thinks a lot that way. Uh, likes philosophy, likes likes mathematics and and science. Yes. <laughs> Hello, Ringer. <laughs> uh, so, um, what we're talking about uprooted. I noticed in uprooted that you make some not so veiled references to uh, the legend of Baba Yaga. Mm -hmm. Are there other uh, fairy tales, like specific ones that you? referenced a little bit in that story? Oh, there are, in fact, the way that I kind of made decisions while writing this book was anytime I had to sort of make a choice, make, choose a, whether it was just like choose how to describe a character sometimes, whether I had to choose, you know, what the characters were going to do next, it was always by figuring out which choice reminded me or evoked a fairy tale for me. And that includes like Pinocchio, um, there's, um, you know, the Baba Yaga stories. There's some Polish lullabies that um, that my mother would sing to me. Um, that are very famous. Um, that's basically stories about um, how a spark, how, how a little spark on the hearth tells stories to a child and says, "I'm going to tell you a really long story." And the story is, once there was a princess and she fell in love with a with a bard. And the king gave them a wonderful wedding. The end. And you know, it's a spark, so that's a very long story from the point of view of the spark, um, which I always loved. And uh, that's the kind of. And I tried to seed all sorts of things. You know, Sleeping Beauty is in there. Beauty and the Beast is in there. Um, basically, every fairy tale that I myself know, and I have loved them and read them for a long time. And those really kind of drove the way the story went. Yes. Is there, when you were writing about the uprooted dragon, is there any crossover in your mind between the, the dragons that you've written in the contemporary series? Like any, any bit of uh, personality or aspects, because they, they call them the dragon, but not. You know, it's very interesting. I was writing Blood of Tyrants. I was writing book eight um, at the time that I started Uprooted, and it was all about, you know, how about if I wrote a story about a completely different dragon? What would a completely different dragon look like? Um, and that's when I wrote the first line, which is, um, our dragon doesn't eat the girls he takes. And I didn't actually realize when I wrote that line that it was a wizard at first. Um, and from there, as I wrote, I kind of discovered the story for myself. Um, in personality, I think there's some there are some connections. I feel like if you read it, you can see there's some, he, he's, he's very much a person. Um, he's not, he doesn't have the same kind of core draconic qualities, I feel like. Um, but there are elements of kinship, maybe between him and, and maybe Temeraire. Maybe Lien would be the closest, um, <laughs> the closest to him, <laughs> if I had to name one. How many languages does Temi know then? <laughs> oh, <laughs> by the end of Blood of Tyrants. By the end of Blood of Tyrants. Um, you know, I think Temerer knows languages, Temerer picks up languages very easily, and this is kind of based a little bit on my own experience, which is when I like to study a language, I can learn it and get by in it reasonably well um, if it immersed in it fairly quickly, and then I lose it again. So I feel like he would, you know, for instance, um, that he he would have a hard time picking up certain languages again um, without a refresher, um, and and he's I think he know he knows a lot. It's definitely you know he's he's a polyglot or what is that word? Um, polymath. Yes. Um, but uh, but so he he definitely picks up languages easily. But I do also find that once you know a certain number of languages, it becomes much easier to learn more um, and pick them up. So that was kind of my idea there. My my hand waving idea, obviously. Great. Yes, Chuck. Your main character starts using magic eventually. Where did you come up with magic words? 
Um, the magic words in this um, were derived from um, uh, uh, the Finnish Urgic um, language group, um, the Hungarian Finnish group, which I forget exact. I you know I have to look it up on Wikipedia again to remember the exact term. Um, yes, thank you. Finno um, and uh, and so the the idea for me was that everyone was mostly speaking the Slavic languages around them and there was this other language um, that that was the source of the of the magical words in a way. So that's how I that's how I came up with them. Initially when I first wrote when I wrote the first draft, um, actually one of the other inspirations which is very distant in this um, is Tolkien-esque. Um, which is it's sort of in my head, possibly only, it is to some extent an answer to the um, to Arwen's death um, in *The Lord of the Rings*, which has always just like pissed me the hell off. <laughs> um, you know that she just goes and basically goes off into the the wild. Her husband dies, and apparently she has nothing better to do than walk off into the wilderness and just die alone on a hill, completely isolated, cut off from everything. Um, and uh, and so that that is also part of the inspiration for this. Um, and initially, when I was writing it, some of the magic words were influenced by that sort of Elvish language. But as I wrote it, and as I realized that it was set in sort of Poland, basically in, the, in a fantastical Poland, um, I realized that those magic words did not work, and so I changed them. It it was it was actually quite hard. Um, the first few times I tried to change them, um, they have become magic words to me. You know, I'd written them, I'd used them many times through, and they had become sort of spells in my mind. Um, but, uh, but when I finally changed them to the final versions, they felt, they felt, they landed in a different way. Um, and it made the magical language throughout more you know, consistent. I remember me personally when it was announced that Peter Jackson had won the contract for Temeraire. I was extremely ecstatic. And it's now been shelved because of the Hobbit. Um, I was kind of hoping for a Horatio Bumbler kind of mini series. What are your hopes and wishes for that? Um, I guess, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, I, um, I'm not, I'm not somebody who is very locked into kind of my creative vision, you know, mine. It, it's, it, once I let, it's part of probably um, the fact that I don't remember things almost after I finish them, which is that I, I, I can let things go. Um, I myself, you know, started by writing fan fiction, and I love remix. Um, if somebody took Temeraire and made a great movie out of it that did not follow my plot, but kept I think the key part for me is the Lawrence Temer relationship. If that is captured, and if those characters are captured, you know, I feel like Lawrence is not Lawrence is not a typical the typical kind of movie protagonist that we see these days. Um, he's a grown adult man who is, you know, extremely responsible, duty driven. Um, you know, he and he has worked very hard to get to his position, um, and is not. You know, and so I wouldn't want that lost. I would very much want that kept, um, and I would want Temeraire's personality achieved, and I think that's a real challenge with the dragon. Um, Smaug made me very happy, um, because just technologically speaking, it was possible to convey, that, that conveyed a lot of personality. Um, it remains to be seen if you could convey a sympathetic personality, because it's obviously, you know, Evil, I'm evil, I'm super, super evil is easier to convey, um, I think, with a scaled, horned, lizard face to, to um, human audiences. <laughs> and Temeraire would deplore, of course, it's a, you know. Um, but that's, that's really the only thing that would matter to me. Um, beyond that, I, I believe in kind of being open because the books, the books are there, you know, they're on a shelf. I've written them, I'm happy, I'm proud of them, and I feel like readers who have enjoyed them, um, you know, I would want the movie to be something that the readers could enjoy. 
that's but that's kind of my limit for whatever I would prescribe. Yes. League of Dragons next year. Uh, February 2016. Okay. Yes. Awesome. So a little less than a year from now is the is a projected date. If it takes me a little longer to finish it, they may slide that a little. Um, but I'm almost done. I'm so close. <laughs> then is there also an idea that's you, you mentioned? You have multiple ideas that are kind of hammering at you, wanting to be written. Is there a forefront runner? Um, wow. The forefront runner is probably um, is probably the the Snow Queen, the Snow Queen Norse. Norse one, um, just because I have a piece of that written. Um, I've also got another piece of a story written that's about um, a search and rescue team that parachutes into Elfland to save stolen children. Um, which, which I is, want that. <laughs> it's you know, and and it's just it's kind of going to be which one grabs me. Um, I feel like one of the useful things about how much how many stories I've written um, in fanfic is that it's taught me something that I can't do and I couldn't have done in just novels because it takes me too long to write a novel. Um, it, there's something called the crack of the bat that I, that I call it, um, where when you're writing a story uh, or you're writing something and you feel like, okay, I got solid wood on that one and that one's going out of the park. and. Um, and it's when I have something that I feel like, if I get 15,000 words of something and I'm like, this has the crack of the bat, that's, that's what I'm going to work on. Um, I felt that with Uprooted. Um, you know, I really knew by that far in that it was really something um, that I wanted to invest, you know, two, three years of my life in. Um, and that's, because that's really, you know, when you think about it in terms of writing a novel, um, editing it, copy editing it, um, getting it published, the cover, promotion, everything. It's, it's basically, that's part of what it is. It's two, two to three years of your life. And, uh, you know, when it's, when time becomes more, as time becomes more precious um, and harder to come by, that's, that's kind of the key. Yes? Okay, so, this might be a bit of a silly question. Um, there are no such things. But, um, I love how you uh, drop references to other works that you love in the books. Like you mentioned, uh, you mentioned that Lawrence was in the gun room on the Leander at the Battle of the Nile, and I only recently realized that uh, Captain Jack Aubrey was on the Leander. At the Battle of the Nile. And yes. It's just I, yeah, Lawrence would not have approved of Jack Aubrey at all. <laughs> no. well, I mean, you know, I think that if they met, they would be completely courteous, but I think that if they spent a long time together, there would be a little bit of a um, Although, you know, by the, that's different. Lawrence at the beginning of the, of the series um, versus at the end of the series would probably have different different reactions. But I love I love throwing in references like that. I've got I have a few references to um, there's um, there's supernatural references in there, there's uh, Star Trek references in there. You know, I like to throw little things in and and it, it's fun for me even if nobody else notices them. So back there, yes. Oh I was just wondering if there's there plans to do uh, from heavy on the four, five, six and then seven eight nine like the first forms like the first three books. Um, so the question is about putting together a compendium. There is, um, you know, the one omnibus edition of the first three, and uh, I would love it if that happened. Um, I don't know that there's, I don't know that there's currently a plan to do so, um, but I think once the series is done, they'll, you know, I think right now Delray is focused on League of Dragons and bringing that out, um, and after that's that's sort of gone through the cycle of hardcover and paperback. At that point, they might um, they might collect the middle three before then, um, but I think they also feel like everything's out in paperback and mass market paperback, which I, is a format that I actually love. Um, you know, it's just so nice to be able; it's so portable, um, and and I feel like works nicely for the book. So I don't know what their plans are. I pretty much leave that all up to them. But I, I would like I personally for my own shelves, I would like three nice hardcover books. I'll 
Hint, hint. <laughs> and yes. Yes. Um, okay, so just getting confirmation when you're talking about Star Trek. In, uh, <laughs> in Crucible of Gold, I think, Captain K and Mr. S, that was... Okay, yes. yes. I knew it. Okay, I feel very vindicated. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, again, I hope everybody's read the book so there's no spoilers. Um, I guess you've read a book by now because it's been up for a while. Um, Loris's Amnesia, how did that come about? Like, did it just pop in your head, oh, I can make Loris have Amnesia, or is there a driving force behind that? I love Amnesia. I, would love <laughs> love I mean, it's one of those truths. I know some people hate it. In fact, there's one fan who's like, who is so mad about the amnesia that he actually wrote me a long, Sean knows this, who wrote me a long letter being like, now before you write the next book, I really think that what you should do is write a new version of Blood of Tyrants without amnesia in it. And, you know, and, um, and I was just like, I love amnesia. <laughs> um, but no, more seriously, I do, I, you know, I love various tropes for one, and amnesia in particular I love because um, especially in a long series. Um, I think what Amnesia lets you do is see the characters kind of, um, and I thought this was important for Lawrence, um, kind of take stock of their choices, of their lives, um, in a way, and say, <coughs> I choose this life. I, I, I do choose this life that I'm in. Um, or sometimes, conversely, they choose a different, they choose a, a different life. Um, and I wanted, I really wanted Lawrence to, in the, in the sort of lead up to the conclusion, I wanted Lawrence to really kind of come to peace um, and, and accept on a deeper level the choice that he made in Empire of Ivory, which is really sort of like the lightning bolt that struck his life. Um, and the, the choice to, to commit treason. Um, and I really wanted to sort of explore that and also have him, in a way, relive um, the experience of, of meeting Temeraire and you know, loving Temeraire. Um, and, and I wanted that. Um, and I felt that that was kind of important to me. That's part of, that was part of my own motivation for doing the Amnesia storyline. Yes. Um, that was inspired because in Victory of Eagles, um, Tharke comes to him in almost the same situation. You know, Lawrence is imprisoned, um, locked up, and um, and I really, you know, for for Tharke's storyline, you know, the question is why why does the amnesia end when Lawrence sees Tharke? And I mean, it, it doesn't end when Lawrence sees Temeraire because I wanted to have Lawrence have the experience of kind of going through. Um, his relationship with Temeraire and seeing it in a sort of outsider way and seeing it from almost the perspective of his former self um, and having to kind of go through it a little bit again. Um, and then I, but I thought that Tharke was someone who was important enough to his life, you know, who's, who's, and also I liked the fact that, um, you know, Tharke had saved Lawrence's bacon a whole bunch of times. Um, and I liked the idea of Lawrence saving him um, and in that moment, having because that that moment where Tharke comes to him and basically takes him out of prison, takes him out of imprisonment, and brings him back into the world um, in in Victory of Eagles, um, is kind of part of is in a sense Lawrence's moment of resurrection um, because at the end of Empire of Ivory, Lawrence expects to die. Um, he considers himself basically dead. Uh, he and and that's the case in the beginning of Victory of Eagles as well. And that moment, then, uh, sort of felt like it was a se another rebirth, basically in both cases. So that's why I chose to make that the moment. And also, I love you know my, my Lawrence Star case shippers, so I'm happy. Yes. Um, on that note, I have kind of a twofer. Okay. Uh, one are again sorry if anybody hasn't finished the book are. Little and Granby currently a couple or in the past? Because I um, Little and Granby's relationship is a oh I'm sorry, 
It's all right. I'm doing fine. fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's. It's, a, it's not a deeply committed relationship because for both of them, their dragons come first. And I think that's the case for many aviators. Um, I think that when they're together, they're happy to be together. Um, but I don't know, I haven't, it, it's not nailed down. So in other words, however you want to write it in fanfic or imagine it, it's, it's wide open. Uh, okay, and the second part, I guess, sort of answers that. But, you know, whether or not any of these become canon, are there any ships that you champion that warm the cockles of my heart? <laughs> um, all of the, you know, what, what warms the cockles of my heart is shipping. I love, I, it makes me so happy that people want, that people have that feeling, have that sort of fanfic feeling about the world in general. Um, I mean, Lawrence Jane is kind of one of my favorite characters. So Lawrence Jane um, is 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 a ship of my heart. Um, but uh, but I also like Lawrence Darkay and um, Lawrence Granby. Um, I feel like there's there's stuff there's stuff for all of you know, and I I like that there's stuff for everyone, and that any of those relationships is plausible in in the context of a story. Um, and yeah. Yes. Well, first, why not Berkeley? What about Berkeley? Oh, Lawrence uh, <laughs> just hasn't had enough time with Berkeley, I guess. <laughs> but, um, my, my big question, the thing that cemented the series for me, like, it, it hooked me just terribly, was Levy. Like, Lawrence's response when when he died, and, like, what, what inspired that? Like, that's, like, one of the best things in any of the books that I read. I just... Thank you, thank you. Yes, I, I love Levitas. I was so sad when he died. Um, and in fact, it's really no. I'm I'm serious. I I had this whole story arc planned where Levitas was going to finally reject Rankin and um, was going to end up with Holland as his captain. Um, and that was you know Levitas was going to get his happy ending. And I realized that it just it was wrong. Um, and in fact, my husband was like, you realize, I think my husband was beta reading it for me as I went. Um, and I think um, partway through the, the sequence, where after we've met Levitas and seen the relationship, and he was like, so Levitas has to die. And I was like, no, no, what are you talking about? Of course Levitas isn't going to die. That's ridiculous. He's got this whole plot. And as soon as I sat down at the book, literally the next day, I was like, he has to die. And, and it was just, and I realized, and it was just one of those things where as I wrote it, it felt incredibly right. Um, and that was, that was hard at the same time. Um, I don't, you know, I am not somebody who believes in, in writing in universes where lots of people die. Um, I, I don't necessarily feel that that's, necessary to, to believe in a universe and to have a universe be feel real and feel solid um, for people to just constantly randomly die um, even though of course yes that happens and that happens in war and there are people in the books who randomly die but in a way I feel like we want our fiction to make more narrative sense um, and so I don't I don't believe in killing characters off gratuitously, but I felt that that was, that it was the right end of his story. That was, that was a true story in a way, um, in the sort of velveteen rabbit sense of real. It was a real story and, and I couldn't sort of tell it otherwise once I'd seen it. Yes? Can I put the special opera in locker before we forget? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh, yes. Um, sorry. So, so uh, yes, we're running low on time. Um, so, I have these special book plates. Since unfortunately, I'm not going to be coming back after Brooded is published. Um, but for anyone who pre-orders the book, I have um, a limited set of book plates. We're not going to be printing these after the book is published. Um, and uh, University Bookstore is going to get a set of these. So, anybody who pre-orders gets a book plate. Um, and these will be just exclusive for pre-orders. So you won't, people, even people who get the sign, the book after, will not be able to get these book plates. So we have those, and we have samplers of Uprooted as well. And I think, is there any last questions? Yes? Why do you hate Grammy so much? <laughs> <laughs> 
why do I hate Grandy so much? I, you know what? It's really funny. I didn't even realize how cruel I had been to Grandy um, until somebody like on Tumblr pointed out in this in this vehement post all the terrible things that had happened to Grandy, and I saw it and I read it and I was like, wow, I'm kind of mean to Grandy, aren't I? <laughs> and uh, yes, so so after that I felt very bad, and then I you know ignored it. <laughs> because I'm a cruel and heartless author. Um, I was going to ask if Granby's going to survive this next book, but I kind of didn't want to know. I'm not answering any spoilers about any bit. No, I refuse to answer. Sorry. Yes. Another reference question. You mentioned a um, supernatural reference, mm -hmm. and I couldn't help but wonder, um, a while ago when I thought about it, um, are Tana and Sifo Yes, yes, they're the brothers. Who, yep. Yes, that was kind of an inspiration. Yeah. All right, um, so, Dwayne, should I wrap up now? And, all right, great. Um, and thank you all so much. Um, I would love to chat more, and um, as you come up, if you've got books for me to sign, I'm happy to sign them. And it's been great to be here. Thank you.